Well, hello, and welcome to Copernic Observatory. My name is Drew Desker. Uh, it's great to see a couple of familiar faces and some new faces. And um, welcome to AstroFest 2021. I think uh, we're struggling a little bit with uh, against Luma, but um, we think our lights are a little more compelling. So, uh, <laughs> and they're here all the time. So, um, um, just as a show of hands, who is here for the first time? One, a couple of people. All right, very good. Uh, who here are members? All right, a couple of people. Uh, well, <laughs> people that just, just signed up. So it's great great to have you uh, with us. For those that aren't members, um, one thing we like to tell people is, um, uh, you know, again, Copernic is a nonprofit. Uh, we don't, we're not really uh, associated with any you know, uh, higher education. We don't get any government money. So uh, we exist by running programs. Uh, we do get some grants for a couple of programs that we do do, but um, also you know, uh, it's memberships that help us keep, uh, keep the doors open. And what's particularly great about a Copernic membership is that we belong to what's called the Association of Science and Technology Centers. It's, over th it's a consortium of over 350 other uh, science centers, and we share uh, memberships, if you will. So a Copernic membership will get you into Roberson. It'll get you into the Museum of Science and Technology up in Syracuse, the Franklin Institute down in um, in Philly, or the Intrepid down in New York City. And it's all, you know, and you get in for free with your Copernic membership. So if you like, if you're a nerdy kind of person, uh, if you like, you know, this kind of stuff, uh, a Copernic membership is actually quite um, uh, quite valuable. Uh, I mean, every Friday night between March and mid-December, we always do some topic, um, a, a talk on some topic of uh, science or engineering, um, and uh, it's not always astronomy, although tonight will be about astronomy, but um, uh, we just really try to help people understand a little bit of how the world works. Um, like next week, uh, last week we had a, a talk on UAVs, uh, drones. Next week we'll have a talk from a Binghamton University professor talking about seismic activity uh, that uh, here in like uh, in northeast Pennsylvania and, and um, southern New York uh, that were induced by fracking and some of the study that he's that he's um, he's looking into that. Uh, two weeks hence, we actually have another Binghamton University professor doing a uh, short film festival um, on it's called the sixth exposure. It's actually the sixth year we've done this. We take little short films about various artists and. Um, with some sort of a astronomical kind of theme to it, uh, or using astronomical images, um, and it was interesting that we we showed one uh, uh, one short film a few years ago, uh, and then I happened to be down in New York City about about nine months later, and it was actually playing in a, a gallery at the Museum of Modern Art. So uh, it's, uh, it was a pretty neat uh, neat thing to be able to say, oh, I've seen that there uh, up at Copernic. So anyway, um, it's great to have you here today. Um, uh, one of the great things about uh, Copernic is, is uh, we really are really so one of the premier uh, public observatories in the Northeast. And um, uh, and later on tonight, you'll have an opportunity to experience that. Um, the skies look like they're going to be really great. Uh, we already have uh, uh, the moon out, but uh, we'll see Je Saturn and Jupiter. Uh, and we'll look at uh, some other um, deep sky objects uh, through our scopes. And uh, the rule here is you cannot leave Copernic until you look through a scope. We'll track you down and make sure that you look through a scope. So um, anyway, uh, AstroFest starts today. It will actually continue through uh, tomorrow, uh, including, uh, again, we'll have some other workshops, uh, some other presentations, and um, including some solar uh, observing. Uh, there's actually a couple of really nice sunspots on the sun, so uh, uh, come back tomorrow, and if you haven't seen the sun through one of our scopes, uh, come on back, and uh, we'll, you'll get a chance to, you know, to check that out as well. So I think what we're going to do now is, um, well, actually, I'm going to say hello also to our, our friends on live stream. Uh, one of the things when we, last year when uh, COVID sort of shut us down for any kind of public activities, we pivoted and started doing our programs via the live stream. We now have over 2,500 uh, subscribers. Um, we've had, we've done a number of uh, uh, pretty sort of high-level uh, uh, presentations. Uh, uh, Jeremy, who is actually <laughs> back behind here, we call him our live stream of, uh, uh, astronomer, 
has done a number of live stream sessions uh, through, through our scopes. We looked at uh, Comet Neowise. We did uh, the uh, Saturn-Jupiter uh, conjunction. That, uh, that one was wild because we had at one point over 4,000 people looking at our, at our live stream at once. The, the chat was flying by like a, a CVS receipt. It was extraordinary. Um, and then even uh, earlier this summer, we did a um, – there was an annular eclipse. It was a solar eclipse that was visible here. It was a, an early morning eclipse. And actually, Jimmy went up to a, a great spot uh, near Syracuse with his laptop and his 5G cell phone and did a live stream from there. So, And what's also great is that on our YouTube channel, all those are all those uh, uh, programs are are still visible or are, are viewable. So you can, if you if you want to go out and check those out, you can go. You know, sometime when you go uh, go home tonight or, or or whenever, go to our YouTube channel and uh, and check that out. So again, for those on the on the on the uh, watching on live stream, if you have any questions uh, for our presenters, put them in the chat. We'll uh, and we'll pass them along. So without. Further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Patrick Manley, uh, who is a member of the Copernic Astronomic Society and uh, the Resident Astronomy Club here. And do uh, he's going to be doing a presentation on one of his favorite topics, is meteorites. I wait for the mic here. One more thing before uh, you leave, in that little uh, triangle, that little pyramid over on the, that's lit up, that is a moon rock that we just received from NASA on a loan uh, for the next few months. So uh, before you leave, you got to check that out. Um, it's it came down from uh, came down with the Apollo 17 mission, and um, it's uh, you can get within about an inch and a half of the moon. So anyway, I'm sorry. Over to you, Patrick. Now it's great. Everybody hear me okay? Oh, I got a little feedback there. I can find the magic spot, so I don't know. <laughs> okay, how's that? Is that good? Yeah. If I could. I want to see you. Because when I get talking, I won't stop, and then I won't see you. <laughs> Is everybody okay with that? Okay, and I am vaccinated, so. Um, all right, so who here owns a meteorite? Anybody in the audience own a meteorite already? Art has one. Anybody else? Who here has touched a meteorite? Okay, so a couple of you out there. Okay, great, awesome. Very cool. I got a couple up here that you can touch, and I got a couple up here that you can see. Drew has a meteor rock that came back in a multi-billion dollar space program. This one just fell to Earth one day. Um, so it's kind of a neat thing that meteorites are kind of they're little visitors, right, from from space, and we're, we're going to cover some of that today, um, and talk a little bit about it, um, and and how they get here, how what are they, right? Um, how did they form, and and then also we start talking about the collection of them. So um, normally I like to do a conversation um, and do a very interactive presentation. Um, because we do have clear skies tonight, though, I'm going to ask that you let me rip through the presentation. Anybody with questions, I can take those after the presentation so that those who want to go observe can. Oop. Oh, that's laser. Which one? This one? Nope. Did I break something, Jeremy? What's well, green? It's just not working, working. Laser pointer. Ah, such obvious things. Who here remembers the word Shelyabinsk? Anybody remember this? Um, Shelyabinsk was a very large meteorite, and you can see it popping up over there. But pay more attention over to here, right? Watch this one. It's pretty amazing. Um, and so in Russia, there's so much corruption in the highway. Everybody has cameras and their dash cams in their cars. So that they can record what you know what was actually happened, what the speed limit actually was, things like that. And so this was the Shelyabinsk meteorite strike. Now I'm going to go on to the next chart. Um, there's going to be a little bit of noise. Don't let it startle you. It happened in 2013. Um, <laughs> or maybe there isn't noise. Oh, there it goes. 
And so this is how they experienced it on the ground after it happened. Um, here's another shot of how these guys experienced it. Knocked the guy down. <laughs> so kind of woke him up a little bit. Um, lots of window damage throughout the town of Shelyabinsk in Russia. Um, tons of window damage, actually. Um, so this is just a shock wave coming from that explosion that you saw. They call that a bolide or a fireball, right? Um, this one's kind of funny. These guys don't even know it. They don't even see it, right? And they're like, what the? <laughs> you know, from the inside of a building. Um, some office workers, right? Uh, just hanging out and have no idea what happened, right? And you can see a couple people got knocked down there. Well, one guy looks like he might have gotten hurt. There were something like 1,700 uh, injuries that day. Um, the hospitals were totally overrun with, you know, no deaths that I heard of. But it, it's a significant event, right, when something like that happens. Um, and it's something to keep in the back of your mind, too, because, you know, that's a lot of energy that you just saw release in that bullet. Now, and there's another office worker. So we're going to move forward and kind of take a look at what it was. Um, up top here, you can see you have the, uh, you know, the, the remaining cloud after it. You can see here is where it was at its brightest flash. After this point here, it was broken up into a lot of different pieces. So the rock itself was about the size of a 747, right? or a good part of a destroyer, right? Um, you know, it, it's a pretty good size uh, thing right here. I'm sorry, this is the one, how big it was. This is the one that hit the Behringer Crater in New Mexico, and this is how big that one was, right? It has a pretty good profile, too, so it gets, you know, it's got a nice aerodynamic shape to it, the way it came in. Um, so they were able to see that as it went across, and when it popped, it took a lot longer for it to pop, which means more energy built up in it. Um, Luckily, it was also primarily a stony meteorite, and we'll talk more about that in a while. Uh, the whole gist behind a stony meteorite is that it, it, it's much more fragile uh, than an iron one. If it were an iron one, there would have been even more energy in it, right? Um, the strewn field is here, and what a strewn field is, is this is the direction of the meteorite, and they're just finding pieces of it all the way along that path, right? The bigger ones fall down here close, or the bigger ones go a little further. The smaller ones kind of fall immediately because they don't have a lot of mass to get their momentum going again. About a four, 440 kiloton blast, about 30 times Hiroshima up in the atmosphere, way up in the atmosphere, luckily. The explosion occurred about 23 kilometers up, so that was goodness too. Uh, so you really only had to worry about the shock wave to the most part. Um, the, the one thing, and we'll talk about this in a few more slides, just imagine, though, if that energy were down and not floating straight across, you know, parallel to the land. So a really significant amount of energy in these things that are coming in. Um, I think my next slide shows kind of the orbital pattern. And we used to believe that most of the meteorites, this, that's this red line here, and you can see the meteorite going here. This is the calculated orbital path for it. And you're going to see Earth come along over here, and you're going to see this collide right with it in the next pass, I think it is. So... Um, keep in mind that these things, they don't move and bang, that's when it entered in. So the way that it was, it was real nice because it just kind of grazed our atmosphere, which is kind of good for Shelyabinsk, Russia. <laughs> um, and that, that's a really uh, good thing to keep in your mind. We tend to think of these things coming straight at our planet, right? But almost nothing is actually coming straight at us. Nothing in our solar systems are really moving in a straight line to the most part because the sun's gravity is so much influencing everything else around it, those things actually do orbit around and around. Um, so, so we used to believe that until very recently. Um, there's a couple of studies that are kicking off where they're going to start doing study on possible interstellar asteroids that come from other, outside of our solar system, um, which is a new field that's kicking off right now, actually. Uh, when they calculate out some of these that you can track them in the sky and figure out what their orbital path is by the way they come across us or go past the Earth. And you can figure out what their orbital path is. Um, some of these, the circles look so large, they're starting to doubt that their sun's in, uh, gravitational influence would actually impact it that much to make it go in such a large arc. Um, it may be as much as 50%, actually, is what they're thinking right now, are not necessarily in that orbital pattern. So 
And that's a recent theory that's been popping up that has to get proved out still. So here's, a, here's another one. This was an Ohio fireball in, in 2013. Most of the time when we see these, they're much smaller um, than what you saw with the Shalyabinsk one. Oop, that didn't do what I wanted it to. Let's see if it does it this time. I thought it would, I had it set to continuously loop, but it didn't. I don't know if everybody saw it. So read up. <laughs> there it is. So down in here, you see that it left a nice little ion trail. That is a much smaller, that's probably something about the size of like maybe a pumpkin, right? Um, there likely, there there likely was a fall, but it was probably a whole bunch of little things, right? Um, maybe maybe the size of like a medicine or exercise ball, but not massive in nature. And most of the ones that we get are that size or smaller, right? And so we don't always see a lot of that kind of damage. Um, but there was a sonic boom for it, so it did slow down from going faster than the speed of sound. So there was a poop boom, right, that went along with it too. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, and here's a shot of it, what it looked like from the ground, uh, somewhere in a farm field um, outside of, I think it was Cincinnati, if I remember. That's 2013. That was a long time ago. <laughs> um, here's a couple others. Um, and you can kind of see, these are all taken by a thing called the NASA Fireball Network. And ah, I am so bad at this. <laughs> yeah, let's do it up here. I should have been doing all along. <sighs> so you can see a lot of these things as they go across. They they can be pretty impressive, right? But they're usually not that big, like the Shalyabin squad. They're usually much smaller. Um, this one doesn't, you know, it, it hits that bolide phase and it and it went through and it it just disappeared. So that one was probably a pretty smaller size. Because as soon as it gets real bright, then it's gone, right? Um, there probably were falls from most of these, though, in all reality. Um, this one here is kind of interesting, and these show up every now and then. This is probably space debris. <laughs> this is probably not a meteor um, coming in. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting thing, um, as you see how slow it's going and how long it's lasting, right? Uh, it, it could still be one, though. Uh, you know, we'd have to go back and do a little research to find out what it was. And here's one just from a couple of weeks ago. Um, you can see it's, it flashes up. Uh, this actually traveled over Ohio as well. Um, so that one lit up for quite a while. Usually they're less than 10 to 30 seconds uh, when you get a bolide like that. They don't usually stay uh, fireballing that long, typically. All of those images, by the way, were taken by a NASA All-Sky Fireball Network. Um, and the, in the the All Sky Fireball Network, what they are is they're groupings of three different cameras. One, two, three, one, two, three, and this one covers a really large range. You got three over in here, you got three in Florida, three three another double cluster of three over there in California and, and whatnot. Um, and the idea behind it is is if you have three cameras on something, you can actually get us you can figure out where it's heading. What, how fast it's going, because you have three different points of reference to look at it, you can get a very accurate reading on, on a lot of the um, physics behind it. So it's kind of an interesting thing to have uh, that. Now, Drew and I are actually have been looking at becoming part of the NASA Fireball Network so we could continue to make another cluster of six up in this area here. So that's something that we've been look to, uh, looking at. We do one here. I have an observatory in northern PA that I'm trying to figure out how to get internet to it because it's in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> um, and then we have to find a third location. So we are looking uh, if anybody has interest. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> so let's do a little house cleaning on terminology because people use these words interchangeably, um, always have and probably always will. Uh, one of the things about it is, is, you know, scientists go out there, they define all these words over the years, and a lot of folks don't realize what they are. So a meteoroid is a, is a mass that's traveling through space. Um, you know, it may be near Earthbound or not, just any rock traveling through space like that could be considered a meteoroid. Um, the meteor um, is 
you know, the mass enters the atmosphere, right? And so that mass goes into the atmosphere. We have meteor showers. Uh, those bolides that I just showed you, they're meteors. They're in the atmosphere, right? A meteorite is when that mass actually touches Earth, you know? So it touches the ground, touches the ocean, touches Antarctica. When it actually lands on Earth, that's when it becomes a meteorite. And a meteor shower is actually when Earth passes through a, meteor, uh, a meteoroid uh, a cloud of particles, right? A debris field that the Earth, the debris field's there, and the Earth actually goes through it. So, and then we give those uh, uh, debris fields names, like the Perseids or or the Orionids or whatnot. And basically, what those are is uh, just those those debris fields, and they're kind of hanging out there in their own little orbit around the Sun, but they they're pretty stationary because they're small, and the Earth passes through them, and that's why we can predict them. And, and when they're going to happen. So meteor showers don't normally lead to meteorites. Uh, you can have a meteorite happen during a meteor shower, but it's most likely not going to come from that debris field. Um, Earth's, you know, if it's big enough to, to make it through the atmosphere or whatnot, um, you're probably not, it's probably going to be affected by other forms of gravity and whatnot, like the sun or the earth or whatnot, and move around. Typically, the shooting stars that we see, you know, they kind of tap out at their largest the size of marbles, and they'll never make it through the Earth, right? They, they'll just never make it through our atmosphere, and they'll burn up before they get there. Um, and then this video over here, the Wisconsin, this is kind of a cool one. Nice framing right by the building. It's going down at a perfect slope, right? That's a really good bolide. So that did not come from <laughs> a meteor shower. This was actually a pretty good sized rock that you see down below there. So some misconceptions about meteorites. Um, they're, like we just said they're not more likely during a meteor shower. Um, fireballs can only really burn for 10 to 30 seconds, typically. If it's going longer than that, it's probably something we have in orbit that's deorbiting that, that you know, we, as the one video that I showed you, um, they're kind of interesting. Almost the space debris is almost more interesting to watch, but it's really slow and it just keeps going and going and going. Um, I've never actually we, we I saw it once actually. I shouldn't say that. Um, meteorites are not scorching hot when they land on the Earth. A lot of people believe that they're actually quite cool by the time they get down. They're coming from 23 kilometers up, like with the Shelyabinsk one, right? And that's going through cold air, right? When it, by the time it hits the ground, typically it's all cooled off, um, you know, and, and and they don't smolder for days. So you might see those videos on YouTube. Whoa, a meteor just struck here, and it's like on fire. No, it doesn't do that. Um, I actually used to have a video of that that I linked to, and it it went off of YouTube, but it was hilarious. It was so bad. <laughs> it was actually really funny. Um, meteorites are not emitting differing late, uh, levels of radiation. Um, a lot of people believe that, but no, no, nothing that they found anyways to date. Um, in the U.S., ownership of a meteorite does not belong to the person who discovers it. It belongs to the landowner who owns the land in the United States. It's considered a mineral, and mineral rights go to the landowner always. So what happens to Czechoslovakia, where the Moldavite is there? Like, what happens to that the landowner? I mean, it's all over. It's yeah, the Czechoslovakian government, I believe, owns that. <laughs> <laughs> you get different rules and different, like Canada, um, they will only release, like most of the meteorites found in Canada are considered scientific discoveries, and they will only release a certain percentage of that to the public. Okay, so, so Libya too, I've got like Libya and Latin. Their rules have been changing, so I can't speak to that. Okay. Libya used to be wide open. You can come in, take it, it's yours. You find it, it's yours. Um, what's that? Oh, we'll get there. <laughs> yeah, we'll get there. Don't worry. <laughs> so yeah, no, those are all great questions, though. It's, it's, it's very true. Um, there, in wherever you go in the country, like the, the Shelyabinsk, Russia has a similar rule to Canada. They're considered scientific discoveries that are owned by the state. And like I have a Shelyabinsk that I got early, uh, and it was smuggled out because they can't, they can't. Legally do that, yeah. So are you talking about Shungite or something else? What's that? Are you talking about Shungite or something else? Uh, no, Shelyabinsk is the name of the meteor fall. That was the one I started with, the big okay. the big one there. 
Um, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it was in 2013. I'll go back to it at the end of the presentation. How's that? Because that is cool. You got to see it. Um, so meteorites used to be viewed as gifts from the from the mystics or from God. Um, sometimes they were viewed as signs from you know evil or witches, right? Uh, you know, you see this thing go through the sky, and maybe you saw it fall on the ground, right? Witness, you know, witness fall, and you're going like, well, what the heck, where'd that come from, right? <laughs> I'm just out here tending to my farm field. Um, so sometimes you see that, and they, they uh, would, it would freak them out, right? Um, 1492 estimated a 280-pound rock slammed into France's town of Ensisheim. I always say I'm going to look up the pronunciation. I never do. Um, Lots of light and lots of noise, right, happen, and showers of hundreds of small little stones across the town, right, and it really freaked a lot of people out. Um, and it, and you know, the local magistrate claimed that it was a supernatural in, in origin, you know, and this was the old, at least when I did this presentation originally in 2013, it was the oldest recorded witness fall of a meteorite, um, you know, that they had found. Uh, limited insight into where there could be lots of rocks flying around in space, so. While in this timing here, they had a good idea about the solar system and how it worked. There was a lot of debate going on about whether, you know, Earth or the sun was the center of the universe. People were being held in prison the rest of their lives if they said it was the sun, right? So it's kind of a weird time, and these, these mytholo mythological almost beliefs are what dominated it. And they pretty much came up with everything they could think of except for, you know, what it ended up being. Uh, for for a description of what was happening. So um, as you move forward, you, you just fast forward another 100 years, heliocentric uh, model of the solar system is really well uh, received by most folks. Um, the scientific debate over that fact had kind of ended, um, and most folks were starting to believe that. By the time you get in the late 1700s, or the very late, almost 1800, right, you got giant, you know. You got a German scientist who's proposing an idea for space for where these meteorites come from for the first time, um, and he wrote a paper there that that kind of walked through his reasoning and his rationale for that, and a lot of people started to buy it, right? And so about ten years later, um, you know, the first asteroid was found, Cirrus. You know, it wasn't a planet. It moved very differently than the planets did. It didn't wasn't the wanderers. It went in a straight line as they observed it across the sky. And so there was a lot of activity there that they're, you know, going around this Cirrus thing. And they started looking for more. And, of course, they found them, right? Um, and then they're saying, like, what is it, you know? Uh, it's, it's not a moon because it's not bound to anything. It's, it's just floating around in space in its own orbit, it looks like. Um, and by 1803, France was kind of the last holdout on this whole meteorite uh, philosophy from a, a, a you know from astronomy perspective. This massive fireball exploded over Normandy, France, and that just changed everybody's mind. They're like, <laughs> "All right, those are rocks," and that apparently came from space. <laughs> and and so this this is a painting, by the way, of of that fireball explosion in Normandy. So I, I guess everywhere they looked, you could see little things floating down everywhere. Again, going forward another hundred years in time, we had an event that, was, that happened in northern Russia called the Tunguska event. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of details about this, but it wasn't necessarily a meteorite that hit the ground. Um, there was actually no mass ever found for this. They believe it was a comet. Like, one of the problems that they have with this is when they were going through, they couldn't even get there. Because when this event happened, whatever happened, it knocked down like almost 80 million trees, is the estimate. You know, thumb up in the air, right? Um, you know, people ask, did anybody die? Yes. They have no idea how many, because it took them so long to even get to those really small towns, those mining towns. Um, so they're, they're not even sure who made it out, who lived, who didn't. The record-keeping communications wasn't there at this time. So it was kind of an amazing event, actually. You know, 30 megaton blasts. If you, I said 440 kiloton blast. Um, yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's right. A lot of Hiroshima's. That's right. And everywhere that you went, this is an aerial shot up here. Right, and you can see all the downed trees everywhere. Um, here's another photograph. This is what they had to contend with. I mean, you couldn't even, 
like ride a horse through that, right? I mean, just really insane uh, activity. And this is why we really have to pay attention to this space, right? It's really important that we understand what's going on in our solar system and, and what's happening out there so that we can kind of get on top of that game because we don't want anything like this getting ahead of us, right? Um, so where do they come from? Where do the meteorites come from? Uh, most, a lot of the meteorites actually predate the solar system, especially the carbonation chondrate, as we'll talk about those later. Um, but some of the meteorites actually predate the solar system. So you have a cloud of debris and stuff, right? And then you have this protostar begins to form in the center of it. And that protostar then, you know, starts gobbling up mass and getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, okay? And then eventually that, that activity happens so much that this starts to have gravitational influence on what's going on in that cloud, and the cloud starts breaking apart. And when that cloud starts breaking apart and all those ionic bonds start breaking, there's an enormous amount of heat generated, and then eventually you get a star. Okay, I'm not going to do the rest of the life cycle of the star. I just want to cover that part of it. And when that star forms, it looks kind of like this. And that debris field that we were just talking about, all those things, there's rocks, there's gases, there's dust, there's all sorts of materials that are in this start to form these accretion disks, right? When that star hits that point where, where it lights up, which, by the way, takes millions of years for that to happen, right? But when that lights up, it'll actually start pushing stuff out this way from the center, right? And you have these shock waves that ripple through the solar system. And then you end up with collections of debris. These collections of debris mostly form together, and the theory is they form together to form the planets, right? But not all of them, as we know. We have asteroid belts. We have, you know, we have two asteroid belts. We have the one between Jupiter and Mars. We have, the, you know, farther out is another asteroid belt. And so we have all these materials out here floating around the sun or a star. And sometimes a planet forms, and sometimes it doesn't. But what you also have, let's see if this does it. All right. You know, we're in a pretty, quote unquote, for a solar system in a steady state, right? Things aren't dramatically changing. But you can see in these regions in here, there's still tons of rocks and things like that floating around in all sorts of different orbits and patterns. And that's kind of what I was talking about before with Shelly Benz, and I'll show it in one orbit, right? Well, all these things are floating around out there, okay? Um, and the idea is, is this is where a lot of the meteorites reside. And again, it could be anything from a golf ball or a marble, right? All the way up to the Shelly Benz or, or the other one there, the Behringer Crater meteorite that I showed earlier on. And so that's what all these little whizzy things represent, right? And they're all being impacted by the sun's gravitational force. And so that's how these meteorites get to those points where it's intersecting with the Earth at some point, right? I think these little circles here like this, I think those are supposed to be the planets, if I'm not mistaken. So it kind of gives you an idea. So why are they important? First, we, I kind of alluded to it at the beginning when I started with this is my moon rock. This one came through Earth's atmosphere and survived. It was probably about three or four or five or ten times the size of it um, the, when it entered the atmosphere. It's a lunar, a proven lunar meteorite. And then in the back of the room, behind that gentleman there, there's a, a pyramid glowing that has a moon sample that came back from the Apollo space program, right? This one's a lot cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> and so we can study these samples, right? We can study them, and I kind of joke around and call them a poor man's space program, right? Because you can actually gather these things up and study them and, and keep an eye on them. And NASA does this, actually, out of the U is it University of Arizona or Arizona State. One of the two, I can't remember right now, but they have a huge meteoritic program there, and that's exactly what they do. If you find a meteorite, you can donate it to them, and they will study it, classify it, and, and whatnot. Um, a lot, it's a lot cheaper to go to Antarctica than Mars, for example, um, to get a Mars sample. Uh, you know, there are problems with this idea, though, is we don't get a choice on the samples that we find. We find what we find, and then we have to study that. They also lose a lot of material, as I said, on the way down. Um, so as you lose that material, it's, it, you, know, you start losing some of the science. Okay, so how do they lose the material? What is the chemistry to that? 
it's not chemistry, it's physics. It's all physical interaction, mechanical interaction with the atmosphere. It heats up, wears it away, um, ablation happens, and material pulls off. If there's any olivine or peridot in the specimen, that all just melts if it's on the... If it, yeah, if it's on... Well, yeah, in that case it does, yeah. Um, so there's all sorts of things going on there. Uh, not that I know of. Diamonds are an earth process, I believe, but I could be wrong on that. Mm -hmm. um, so studying fail, you know, f studying fa the falls themselves helps us learn better. Like studying Shelley events helps us better learn how to detect and prevent. Um, learns maybe we can come up ways to deflect or defend it. That's a good example. We have most of the really large what we could call planet killer uh, asteroids. We have those mapped out, understood. We know where those are. It's the Shelly Bank size things that worry us the most, right? That one of those might come down and, and impact a city. So studying these things helps us understand better how those materials are going to interact, how we might be able to deflect them, etc. Um, and the other thing that makes them kind of important, and, and you were alluding to this earlier, they are the most rarest things on Earth, actually. They're rarer than gold. They're rarer than diamonds. They're, you know, they're the most unique finds. Um, some of them look like animal shapes, and those ones become extremely expensive. Um, you can get one. I have one that looks a little bit like a rhinoceros, and I paid through an eye tooth for it, right? Because it, it's they're very rare, but they're really Where neat. Where that one come from that you have? Uh, we'll get there. Okay. Um, so very high demand collectible market. These numbers may actually be outdated because there's more people who are interested in them today, and I'd have to probably go refresh these. But the scale kind of gives you a good idea about what we're talking about here. You know, if you have a common unclassified one, it could be less than a dollar per gram, right? Um, but by the time you get down to rare finds, ten dollars to fifty dollars per gram, um, extremely rare finds and unique shapes and features could be a hundred to whatever thousand, ten thousand per gram. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of these ones um, and, and some of the phenomena that happens with them later. So we have three different types, basically the irons, and the irons are iron. <laughs> they have a little bit of nickel in them. I have one up here that we can pass around at the end of the discussion here. Um, and this one, they weigh a lot. They have a high density. They got a lot of weight to them. They're almost well, they are almost always, there's a one type of iron called an ataxite that doesn't really have a lot of nickel in it. But they're almost all uh, combined with nickel, and that's what this little pattern here, and they call it the Widman statin pattern. It's the crystalline structure. If you had one the size of this building, right, and you cut it right down the middle, you would see the crystalline structure of that, of that rock as clear as day. Um, you were talking about even irons are surrounded by other materials. And also, those materials get worn out of these crevices, and then the ablation that happens from the heat on the specimen causes these little thumbprint shapes that you see here and over here. And those are, those are known as reg regmolips, um, and they really are. They feel like if you get one the size of your hand, your thumb fits right in it. It's kind of weird. <laughs> um, but that's from some of the materials that wore away, and then it just kind of softened off the edges of the iron. Um, and because it's happening under a, a stress, you know, an atmospheric stress, it, it kind of has a fluid dynamic characteristic that causes these little wavy things to happen. And that's the ablation. Then you have the stony meteorites, which Shelyabinsk was more of a stony meteorite. They still have iron and nickel in them, but it's not a formed metal, if you will. It's not an, a, a crystalline structure like you saw on the other one. There's just deposits of iron and nickel in them. There's also other deposits, all of these little dots in here. That's kind of what happens when things form outside of a strong gravitational field. So on Earth, rocks layer. In space, if you have a rock, it kind of looks more like this, and they're three-dimensional things, right? And those things are called chondrules. And those, if it has a lot of chondrules and a lot of different materials in it, like these two do, then it's an, a chondrite. If it's like this one over here, where there's not a lot of chondrules in it, and there's not, a, but it's one solid material, maybe it's got a couple other things in it, but not a lot, they call those achondrites. And so they don't have as many chondrules in them. There are thousands of varieties of these, if not tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of different ones that are out there. Um, and there are more always being found. So there's people who go and, and as you were talking about Libya, go out to the Sahara and just 
constantly out there meteorite hunting, and they keep finding them, keep finding them, keep finding them. So, and then you get, you know, out of the stones, there's a, a special type that I talked about earlier where there's a lot of carbon in it, and they're usually pretty black, both on the outside and on the inside a lot of times, or a dark, dark brown. And now the ones, the things on the inside, these little chondrules that are in here, they actually can consist, you know, they, they date these back to about four and a half billion years ago, you know, or older, um, prior to the solar system forming. But when you actually test the materials that are in here, you actually find that there's organic materials in there. Um, you know, things, things that, excuse me, um, you know, detection of amino acids, building blocks for life, not life, don't, don't misread it. Also, trace amounts of water. It can be caught in some of these little pockets that are in here, and you can slice the rock open and actually detect water inside them. Um, so all sorts of things that are happening in these, and like I said, they date way, way back. Um, yeah, and I already said most of these represent the oldest things in the solar system, so that's very interesting. And then you get the really pretty ones, and these are called stony irons, and there's other types of stony irons. I'm just going to talk about the palisades today. Um, they're basically what they are is an olivine, right, surrounded by nickel iron. Um, some of these, like this one here, you can see has a Widman stat pattern on the iron structures, but it also has these, uh, you know, this olivine here. And that olivine that's in these is very similar in most cases to peridot, right? Um, it's even facetable, um, you know, and there's a company out there called uh, Pelido, actually, um, and, and that's where these images come from is Pelido. And these, and what they can do is they can facet them and make jewelry out of them just like regular peridot, which is kind of interesting. Um, but some of these things can go for five to $7,000 per carat because they're rarer than anything else that we have on Earth, right? So how do they land? And that's what a lot of people, this is where a lot of people, people see this Behringer crater when they're very young, and they think that's how it goes every time, right? When the reality is most of the meteorites actually they blow up in the atmosphere, and they just shower rocks out. They kind of float down to Earth, you know. Um, they can make more of an impact if they have a straight down velocity, not an outward loft like that. If they have a straight down velocity, they can make a bigger impact on them. Um, so we talked about the fireballs, and we saw a whole bunch of those. They basically come down, and then you get a point at which they can no longer take the pressure, and the object just blows up, and the rocks go poof, just like you think they would. We also talked a little bit earlier about a strewn field. So it's going this way when it blows up, right? So it's going this way. It blows up. All the lighter things get left back here. All the heavier pieces go a little further. And this big oval here is called a strewn field, okay? Now, we'll talk a little bit more about what happens here. It's the same kind of idea. It just It's a bigger object, so it's able to hold on a little longer. So we have craters all over the place across, you know, the, the globe. They show up and they look in very different forms. Um, you know, if you're walking down here, you might not recognize this as a crater. It might just look like a weird stream in a valley, right? But you can kind of see some of the elevation changes here, and the water kind of highlights the circle, right? Um, you know, this is a little more obvious. If you're walking around that, you might go, this looks like a crater. <laughs> um, the idea being is that it comes down... The, when the meteorite comes down, it hits. I thought, do I have a detail slide on that? No, I think I do. Yeah, so I won't do that then. Okay. Um, all those craters that I showed on the prior chart there, there's this thing out there on the internet called the Earth Impact Database, and it has all the craters in it. It's kind of cool. Um, I really recommend folks go and take a look at it, right? Because it is a pretty neat, pretty neat uh, site. It has photographs and links to information about that particular crater. They have very large rock approaches the surface of the Earth, so it's coming nearly straight down or at a sharp angle down. Um, and that very large rock, as it comes down, you know, just before impact, actually, there's so much force coming back from the ground. The act, that's when that bolide event happens, just like you see up in the atmosphere. There's so much force going against it, it can no longer stay together. And that's when you get kind of an explosion that happens. Um, this in that. Uh, explosions kind of interesting it doesn't actually go and drive into the ground the rocks actually kind of fountain out if you will um, but what also happens is, is the stuff in the ground below it 
also fountains out. <laughs> and that's why you get the crater. Um, kind of a funny story about that Behringer crater in Arizona. The guy who bought that, he bought it thinking he would be loaded with iron. That, that had to have been an iron meteorite. Like He was smart enough to know a meteorite caused that crater. And he knew it had to have been an iron meteorite that did it. And so he thought, I'm going to buy that crater. And he spent a ton of money on it, right? Never found a single ounce of iron in the crater. <laughs> and today, the same family owns it, I believe. Um, and it's just a tourist attraction. They've made their money back, but <laughs> not the way they thought they were. And it took a lot longer. Um, so, so it breaks up that meteorite. And the meteorite fountains out and spreads out around it. So you find all the iron for Behringer Crater and the property around Behringer Crater, not at the crater itself. The earth materials also from down there can melt, and then you get impactites. And that's basically a glass like the one in Czechoslovakia, the Moldavite, is an impact glass. Um, so it's an impactite, actually. And broken fragments of meteorite can be spread you know, far and wide depending on you know, the amount of force that happened with that explosion. right? And so this is kind of cool. This is called Panther Mountain, New York. It's not too far from Binghamton. So here's Binghamton right here. And here's Panther Mountain right there. This is Route 88. And this is 17 down through here, right? So it's in the Catskills. But it is an impact crater. And it took them a long time to prove this, too. Um, and I can't remember the guy's name. Did I have it up here? Yeah. I can't remember his name. But yeah, it's in Shendank in New York is, is the town. The town's like up here, I think, if I remember right. Or it might be this one there. Um, but there haven't been any meteoritic finds on this. This happened a long time ago. And, you know, our meteorology, our geology, you know, we're very active geologically, right? And then we have the weather and a whole bunch of other things. So it's really worn down the materials. You can find what they call shale. They call it shale. I don't know why they call it shale. But it's basically the broken down rust from the original meteorite. So you can find the, the meteoritic shale there. Um, but it's just rusted iron is all it is. Um, so people have found that in this, in this area. That's the only one I know of. This one actually isn't even listed yet on that database. But it was, it was considered a meteorite crater uh, probably back in the 90s, I think, I want to say. So, but it happened 300,000 years ago, so. Just a creative guy who said, you know, I flew over that the other day, and that really looks like a crater. So, so we talked about meteor crater already. Um, you know, many meteorite samples found. Here's what it looks like from space. It's about four. Was it four miles across? Is that right? One point two kilometer, point eight diameter, right? So point eight miles across, and about fifty meters deep. So that's about one hundred and fifty feet deep, roughly. So. That's a big crater. They have a visitor center there if you're ever out, and, you know, it's a great day trip. It's outside of uh, Flagstaff. So. Another famous meteorite is Hoba, <laughs> and this is in Namibia. Um, kind of an interesting thing. Farmer one day plowing his field. Clonk! And he couldn't get, his, he couldn't get it out of there, um, and so he kind of farmed around it. <laughs> And it was rumored to have been a plowing, you know, the guy was plowing a field and he ran into something, couldn't move at all without the horse drive, you know, in the horse driven plow. So many years later, the owner of the land donated the rock and site. Um, it was, you know, it, and, it, and gave it to the government there. And the rocks ever since, they put a nice little, you know, little memorial around it or whatever so everybody could go there and hang out and check out the rock. So kind of funny. Um, it's a big one, though, 60,000 tons. That's huge. I believe it's in uh, Africa, isn't it? Is it Africa? I think so, yeah. I think so. Um, so this one's kind of also has a great story behind it, and this is one of the ones that I'm going to go into about the uh, the cost of it. So this is called Zagami. Um, Zagami is a Martian meteorite. It was the first confirmed Martian meteorite. It was finally confirmed after uh, the Voyager space probe touched down, sent back some information back to, to Earth, right? And then they were able to compare some of the gases caught in the specimen to, the, to that data and that information. So it's been a hard confirmation that it's a Martian meteorite. Uh, it, it, and they call it shergatite. It's the type of Martian meteorite. Um, 
it landed about 10 feet away from a farmer. The farmer heard this tremendous noise, and then the meteorite kind of buried itself in a, in a hole two feet deep. Um, so it came straight down with a lot of energy, right? Um, many interesting legends about this fall, everything from it hit his dog and killed his dog to, you know, hit his dog and didn't kill his dog. <laughs> you know, a lot of, a lot of tales that have spun up off of this one. What's interesting, the reason why I threw this one up here, though, is because this is one of those examples where it was worth a lot when it fell, especially after it was confirmed what it was. And so when you get to that point, you're sitting there, you're looking at this rock going, it's from Mars. Like, we've verified it's from Mars. We have the means to do this. And that's really cool. Um, it's got a nice little farmer story behind it. It was a witnessed fall, so somebody actually saw it, right? It interfered with his day, <laughs> which which actually starts, believe it or not, adds to the cost of a meteorite, right? It, it actually messed up his day a little bit, especially if it killed his dog, right? I mean, now he's got a country song going. Um, and so he, he, as you go down through this thing, there was a lot of a lot of specimens that are around the area too of this so there was a lot recovered of this rock um, but it's also highly sought after if you find something that's bigger than a pinhead today for a sample to buy you, you'd be lucky and you're gonna pay like five hundred dollars for that little grain of <laughs> zagami and you're also gonna be wondering the rest of your life is it really zagami <laughs> So this is an example where the cost just ran away on it. And if you go look at, I haven't looked in a while on the internet, but it, the prices for Zagami are insane, right? But it's so highly sought after. Canyon Diablo, that's the name of the meteorite for Behringer Crater. So, um, you know, tons of this material laying around the desert. One of the cool things about it is the story and the, and the legend behind, um, you know, Behringer Crater adds to the cost of the meteorite but also it has this cool desert patina to it, right? With all these really neat, uh, you know, uh, colors on them. One of the things we haven't talked about, because I forgot to, is some of these meteorites are extremely stable, meaning you could take that, throw it in a swimming pool, and leave it in there for a couple days, pull it out and set it on your dining room table, and it won't rust. Um, and this is one of those. Some of those, like those palisades that I have, if you leave them out in this room overnight unsealed, they're going to rust. Um, so there's some of them are extremely volatile and some of them are extremely stable. And and Canyon Diablos is one of those. It's extremely stable. Uh, if any of you here have held and seen Copernic has a meteorite that's a Canyon Diablo. It's a bigger one. Um, and that one's been to every school in this area many, many times. So... <laughs> Um, so these are uh, Sakodi Alin, uh, Alina, I think they actually say it that way. Um, this meteorite is extremely stable. Um, this is my one that looks kind of like a hippo head, right? Um, you know, these are really just beautiful versions of this. Now there's whole individual pieces, and then there's fragments. The whole individuals, like this one and this one, look amazing. I mean, just the shapes on them the shine on it, right? They're all shiny like this, and they're all extremely stable. Oh, is this one chilly? This is ours. Oh, yeah, this is the Canyon Diablo. Yeah, this is the Canyon Diablo. We can send this. Everyone and child in this county has touched it over the last 10 years, so <laughs> you might want to wash your hands afterwards. <laughs> This is another one that's highly sought after. Uh, this occurred in Peekskill, New York. Um, I don't know if anybody here remembers this event. I remember it when I was a child. It was all over the national news. Uh, the uh, I have a video, actually, that somebody uh, restored. Um, but it, I think it was like, was it from Tennessee to New York, right? Could see this thing, if I remember right. Do I have it in here? I don't have it in here, but it, like it started in Tennessee and it lasted forever. And everybody said, "Well, fireballs never last that long," because I said so, right? Um, but this one did. And then the best part about it was it hit the guy's car, or it hit, I think it was a woman's car, actually, if I remember right. Yeah. And she sold that car. She bought it like a couple days beforehand for like 500 bucks, and was extremely bummed that her car got trashed by this rock from space, right? And she sold it for fifteen thousand dollars. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's worth fifteen thousand. You got to pay out, right? 
So, and here, here's the uh, actual, and it's just, stuff's just stripping off it. But it's kind of like the Shelyabinsk one. It's kind of going parallel, you know. So it's going a really long time, right? But once it hits the earth, you said there's no fire, there's no flames, there's no nothing, right? Just mass, <laughs> you know. There is a story of, it was a woman, and I can't remember where she was, and she was just sitting there in her house, eating her breakfast or something like that, and one went right through her house, you know. So, yeah, you know. And what's really neat about this is this is the first recorded fall of a meteorite. Um, so it was like, a, you know, people had their camcorders out, and they were off filming it, you know. And so there was some 14 different sources of, of video. It's the first time that a witness fall had been recorded. So it's kind of a neat thing, too. Now, Willamette is a really fun meteorite. Who here has been to the American um, Museum of Natural History down in New York City? Anybody? You've all seen this. This is down there today. It's in the big lobby. It's propped up on, you know, very prominently, just like this. This is the display there. Um, it's a great great specimen um, massive thing right uh, this was probably all like we were talking about before it was probably all olivine and things like that that eroded over time but the iron persisted and stayed so this was probably like one of those stony iron meteorites when it when it first fell um, so it's got a really funny story behind it so these people uh, what was his name? Something Hughes, Ellis Hughes, in 1902. On, and he, they found it on land owned by uh, an Oregon and steel company, right? And so they, 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 the the whole mineral rights thing hadn't been established yet. So they tried to sneak it out. They created this really primitive device out of wood, a whole bunch of wood, right? And these, I think the wheels even look like they might be wooden. And they got it up on there. And it took them like 90 days or something like that, and they got it off their property, okay? And so, you know, the Hughes guy there, he really understood the value of it, right? And he knew he knew what it was, and he knew how much it would be worth. And so he went ahead and just, like I said, took him 90 days to go three-quarters of a mile. <laughs> so a lot of work, right? So after a, you know, but it, the word got out, and then there was a lengthy court battle for it, and the judge kind of said that the steel company was the rightful owner. The iron and steel company was the rightful owner. Um, and then the iron and steel company sold it to this wealthier person, William Dodge, for $26,000, right? Which back in those days, in the 1900s, that was a lot of money. Um, and then donated the, and then the, the wealthier guy donated it to the Museum of Natural History in New York City, and that's how it got there. So this was big news, like this was, you know, you had your newspaper and every couple of weeks this story would show up in it because it was a huge court battle. And like I said, they said it's mineral rights. They, they own it because it's mineral rights. Probably if it wasn't an uh, iron and steel company that was doing the suing, we might not have that rule today. Um, so moving on, collecting meteorites. Um, the number one thing you want to do is make sure you have a trustworthy dealer, right? I can't reiterate this more. There are people who go out in their backyard, they pick up a rock, they throw it on eBay, and they say it's a meteorite. Okay? You really want to make sure you're getting a trustworthy dealer. Um, there's a group out there called IMCA, I-M-C-A. You can look it up. If they're a registered IMCA, they're most likely a trustworthy dealer. Um, if they are not registered in IMCA, I would be extremely skeptical of them because um, it's really hard to prove this stuff, right? And if you want to prove it, you probably got to spend more money than you got to spend buying them the specimen. So some of the higher end dealers cost more. I like Aerolite meteorites. Uh, for those of you who might have seen the show Meteorite Men back in 10 years ago or so, um, there's a guy named Jeff Notkin who runs uh, Aerolite meteorites or owns it rather. Um, I, I tend to like going to those. They cost a little bit more, but you're getting one. They get pick of the litter. They get the good stuff like that rhino specimen I had for the Sakodia land, and a lot, almost all my meteorites have come from, uh, you know, either Jeff or Steve Arnold. Um, is there IMCA dealers? You type in IMCA? IMCA is the website, yeah. It's, a, it's an organization. That That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, 
so so that's the one thing I could offer to you is that if you do spend your money at a more reputable uh, and, and you'll learn who those are really quickly by doing a little bit of research they do cost a little bit more but they're getting the better stuff at the end of the day um, really important I store all mine in airproof containers I have both oxygen and water desiccates inside the container I tend to use uh, retired military uh, ammo boxes um, they have rubber seals in them that are meant to go hundreds of years to protect the, the ammunition in the box. Uh, so they work really well uh, for, for sealing in meteorites. Um, you know, so, some people uh, test to some of your irons that are more prone to rust, maybe lightly uh, lubricate them with clear gun oils, um, but not a lot. Like, don't soak it in it, right? Just get it on your fingertips and, and work it on there. Um, and then, you know, Prevent first, but deal with rust early if you start getting it. Um, you can stop it in a lot of cases, and you can do some research on the web on how to do that, right? Um, there's a, a group out there, too. I know that it's hard, it doesn't show up well on the screen here. Uh, but there's a, another website out there that's like an open forum called Club Space Rock. Um, and Club Space Rock is actually sponsored by Jeff Notkin as well. Um, and there's a lot of reputable people out there you can ask questions to, things like that if you want to. Um, on how to care for and, and how to react to things like rust. If you get a palisade and it start palisade and it starts rusting, sorry, <laughs> I have one that I'm going to share with you. <laughs> um, it does happen. Uh, they're getting really good and the new pallet, like when you go to the guy, the more expensive dealers, they're getting really good at sealing in the palisade meteorites now so they don't rust. Um, so identifying them visually, like, you know, because I'm in this, there's probably three people who have one in their pocket in the room tonight. <laughs> and that's a joke, but I always get asked to identify meteorites. Is this a meteorite or is it not a meteorite? The vast majority of things found are meteor wrongs. They're not meteorites, right? <laughs> and so with that in mind, meteorites are geologically graceful in their very nature. Everything you saw there, they're just smooth lines. Um, you know, the surfaces are smooth in most cases. Even the ones that have quote-unquote rusted or acquired an earth patina, those are also uh, really noticeably meteorites, right? When you look at an earth rock, you know, it's layered. It might have uh, vesicles in it. Uh, if you don't know what vesicles are, those are the little, air, the little holes you see in rocks. They're little pinholes that you see in the rock, earth rocks. That's where when the rock cooled, an air bubble kind of creeped up out of the rock, right? Um, you won't find that you won't find that phenomenon occurring in space because it's mostly low gravity environment, right? So it's not going to happen that much in space. Um, you know, an, another good hint too is you know if you put a really strong magnet to it and that thing doesn't move at all, it's very likely not a meteorite because almost all meteorites have iron and nickel in them and should react somewhat to a, to a magnet. Um, and then the surface features on them, the regmolips, the thumbprints that we talked about, rust or native patina, sh you know, shading of, of, you know, taking on the look and appearance of the rock it was embedded in or the desert it was embedded in. Crondules, uh, we talked about if you were to cut a window into it, they call it, and you see those little round spheres in there, then you know that's probably a meteorite. Fusion crust, which is a black crust. I said look for black rocks, right? Fusion crust or black, it's like a black crust on it that's from when it burned, was in the atmosphere, you know, reacting with the atmosphere. And then oriented, almost all, if you have a whole specimen, oh, cool, thank you. It's heavy, isn't it? Almost all of the whole specimens have an orientation to them, like a little nose print, this one that's kind of here, right? Um, where usually they're even smoother. Like this one, you can kind of see there's like this roughly nose print to it, right? Where it's really smoothed out, and that's the thing that was leading the charge, right? Actually, it's probably going this way, right? And then on this side, you see that little, there's like a, I'll pass this around, but on this, you'll see there's like these little lips on the sharp edges, and they call those the rollover lips, and that's what happened as it got oriented. You know, it rolled over, and it left a little bit of stuff on the side of it. So I'll pass this one around, too, because you can see the rollover lip on it really good. Um, so, you know, earth rocks, you're not going to find any of that kind of stuff. Generally speaking, you can find regma lips on earth rocks. That can occur in a stream, right? Um, you can also find volcanic rocks. 
but volcanic rocks almost easy. They look very similar in shape to this one and some of the others I'll show you, but they uh, they're really light. They don't have any they don't have any iron nickel to them. They have a lot of the vesicles on them, by the way, um, so they can look similar in, in appearance to meteorites. So you, tools that you can use, you know, these rare earth magnets that are really strong. You get those like on the end of a walking stick or on the end of you know you know one of these matlock thingies or or just a regular telescoping stick with a rare earth magnet on it and you don't have to pick them up you can see if they're magnetic or not right um this is an excellent book for people who are just starting out and want to learn to do more meteor uh meteorite hunting um these guys too i've never been on one but they sometimes sponsor trips obviously not the last couple of years um they'll sponsor trips or have uh sessions where they'll have like a, a small class that they teach and then they they'll hold the class at a place that has commonly has meteorites that you can go out and hunt for and find on your own you know as part of the class and so i can send this information out tv shows i mentioned discovery science channel net geo always have shows on meteorites and the planet killers and stuff like that right um the meteorite men were formerly on the science channel i believe they're still on itunes and amazon this is a great show for learning about them, not just learning about hunting them, but learning about meteorites and more information on them. I also believe if anybody has Curiosity Streams, I think that this is now airing on Curiosity Streams, if I remember right. Uh, a couple books that I have them up front here if you want to flip through them. I have these two here um, by O. Richard Norton. These are great books, by the way. Um, and then also, I couldn't find this. I think I loaned it out to somebody. Um, the Art of Collecting Meteorites by Kevin Kachinka, um, another great book uh, for, for just kind of learning about meteorites and meteoritics and whatnot. So that's my pitch. I don't know if anybody has any questions, comments. Um, Jeremy, can I get the light on up here and I can show up a few specimens? Um, anybody have any questions or anything they want to ask? Yes. Are we going through the photon belt, therefore we see a lot more of the, um, you know, fireballs? Um, the fireballs really have to do more with, they're pretty random, right? Uh, they seem that way anyways, because you have so many things that could go on, and I should probably back up so you can see some of the earlier charts that I showed. I could probably do this better on the other. Are we in the photon belt, though, or is there movement? Because we are either... I think it's technology, and we're paying attention, right? Um, so I don't know. Did you see this graphic? Oh. <laughs> technology. I'm in IT, too. It's pretty sad. So it's a little hard to see, but there's an orbit being shown here in a red line. I don't know if you can see that. And then over here, I can't see where he is right now with the light on, unfortunately. Um, there's a, a little dot going right there, and then it hits Earth. So that's one, right? Now, Would that be in the photon belt, technically? I'm not really familiar with that term, actually. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, check it out. Yeah, I'll have to. We are going so here's the thing from Shelly Binks that I showed earlier. And I'm going to just show it again. You so you can see huh? when that phenomenon happened in 2013, it was a big rock. So that was one of the ones we were talking oh. about. So it just totally, you know, the shockwave totally caused all sorts of havoc. So I'll let that play, but I'm going to turn this sound off. So it's 23 kilometers is where the event happened, and that shockwave traveled 23 kilometers. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was knocking people down, yeah. yeah, yeah. Knocked false walls down. Yeah. So this is where you see some glass come through. Like these guys are just. Oh my god. <laughs> so that'll wake you up. Here's an example of a false wall inside a structure coming out and falling down. 
and the people are like, what the heck? <laughs> so you got to kind of feel for them, man. That was a bad day. So that's what made this one of the ones that was so sought after. It was recorded. It was a witness fall, right? It heavily impacted people, right, in their day. Um, so it was very interesting. Like, the meteorite hunters were there like that because they knew it was a cash cow, you know, and they wanted to get them before the Russian government got them all. So, um, yeah, so, so you know, when you have this kind of interaction with a meteorite, it really, you know, out ups its price, so to speak if you will. Um, so I had another thing that I think, you're, the, and it's going to kind of answer your question, do I think it's the technology? Yes, I think it's the technology. Because we actually even have, and I showed it, a simulation, a simulated model, right, of the specimens that are out there. What about planet X and planet 9 towards, heading towards the Earth? Well, that hasn't been proven yet, right? Um, there are some who believe that there may very well be a Planet X out there because um, they're seeing some inconsistencies in, in the way they're seeing interactions and orbits change in the Oort cloud. Mm -hmm. So they think there may be something way out there, but they're not ready to call it a Planet X yet, right? Um, they're more thinking along the lines, maybe it's a brown dwarf that's nearby that's really hard for us to see for whatever reason. But all that's just conjecture, right? I mean, so I showed this graphic earlier, right? So they're still not willing to basically come out with it. Yeah. Most of these detections, most of the detections we have, too, are, we've got to remember, are infrared-based. So it's not that we can see them. It's that we're using technology to find them, right? So a lot of these things that we look at are a variety of different types of detections. And all that data they've captured, they put into these models, right, to kind of come up with these types of simulations. So do you have any technology here with the infrared to look out in space? Infrared, no. No. I mean, you can buy infrared. Most of our stuff's amateur astronomy. So you can buy infrared filters and whatnot. So you only, But it's got to be emitting bright IR to see it, right? You're not going to detect asteroids that are out there that don't have any sunlight on them, right? Good question, though. Any other questions from folks? Yeah. yeah. You said that Antarctic and Sahara, you can find them. That's because they're on a light surface or a dark. Is it true that, not it's true, but are there as many meteorites around here that we just don't see? Probably so, yeah. And it's not just that they blend in, so we kind of don't see them to your point, but they also erode, they corrode, right? They they get worn down by our, our climate. You know, it's a particularly wet here. On my meteorite hunting chart, I didn't say it, but don't, yeah, try not to go here. <laughs> you got a couple days, maybe, right? Especially this year, right? Yeah, go ahead. Um, there's people who believe Planet X was, a, was an idea that was thought up some time ago with actually no scientific evidence behind it whatsoever. It was just one of those things where people thought maybe there might be something out there or it could be something out there. And since you couldn't prove it wasn't, it kind of emerged. More recently, they've started studying the movement of uh, asteroids in our furthest out belt of asteroids called the Oort Cloud, right? It's way out there by, like, Pluto's part of the Oort Cloud, right? So it's way, 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 way out there, right? And they've been detecting changes in, in orbits of these semi-large objects. And they're, and they're not major changes. They're not like right turns and I'm going the other way, right? It's like just things they didn't predict ha could happen without some other gravitational body out there to influence them. And so came to life that, you know, um, one of the guys that, uh, that uh, you know, Michael Brown, I think, is behind some of the speculation here. He's one of the guys that downs Pluto, right, as a planet, right? <laughs> um, you know, some of the folks are sitting there going, oh, this is fun. We can call it Planet X. <laughs> but isn't there a planet Nibiru? That is, Nibiru and X, I think, are the same thing. Because that's an ancient mm -hmm. story, I think, in the Bible. That's right. Yeah. Well, well, it's an ancient story. I don't, is it? I'm not, not sure if it's biblical, though, right? Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know enough about the background okay. in Nibiru. Um, but it's the same idea, right? No one's ever seen it. No one's ever said, yeah, it's there. 
but they're, they're starting to believe that there might be something out there now that has some gravitational influence on the outer reaches of our solar system. And so they're in, in a fun way, they're calling it Nibiru or Planet X. <laughs> Well, they kind of demoted it, right? Yeah, it's a dwarf planet. It's it's still a big. Yeah. Um, if you go out and look at the look up the NASA uh, mission New Horizons, right? It's a fascinating body. They have all these pictures of it and everything now. It's just fascinating what's going on on that planet. When we thought of it before, we thought of it as a distorted set of pixels. You know, we, <laughs> you know, we didn't really have a concept of how, uh, you know, immense it is and how different it has all these different geological regions. And like, why is that? Like, what's been happening on that planet? You know, on that body. Um, technically, though, right now, under the way things are defined by the IAU, it's a dwarf planet. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that if you called it anything else than Pluto, nobody would care. <laughs> but because it's the same name as the, the cute Disney character, all of a sudden people get all sorts of... Yeah, nobody cares that Xena is a dwarf planet. Yeah, too. let's call it Aldon and, and see if anybody cares about it. So what's the explanation that Earth is the farthest out from other planets? What's your explanation for that? It's not. I mean, does that mean that we're less evolved than all these other? I mean, does anybody have any ideas about that or historically? The Earth isn't the furthest one out. It's the third right, one out. The old, uh, well, I think we're the youngest. <laughs> I think we're the youngest. No, they're all about the same, four and a half billion years. They all formed yeah. at the same time. Okay. Yeah, roughly. I mean, when this. Let me get back there. When this event happened, all the planets roughly formed at the same time when the sun did. And they all formed a little bit different schedules. How you can about, though, if we all formed together, we evolved differently? And therefore, some evolved at a faster rate than others. No, I don't think so. And what about being closer to the sun versus farther from the sun? Uh, we're, we're the third planet out. We're 1 AU out. We've always been roughly 1 AU out. If we had two moons or one moon? Good question. I don't know. There's different the theories there. Right? Well, there's different theories there, actually. Oh, pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Did you try to curl this one? <laughs> <laughs> Did you see these? Oh, <laughs> nice and heavy. Yes, that's oh, mine. Okay, right. Yeah, yours is over here on the okay. table. This one's yours. The Canyon Diablo. Right. Oh, thank you. See, his, I don't know if everybody noticed, but I was talking about the Canyon Diablo before. And, and this one is getting a little bit of rust in here, right? But, like, when you come to this side, you see how dark it is, right? And, and then you see, like, these little red imprints all over the place. That's all from the sand, you know, battering on it. Like, here's a good spot over here. It's got these red, in, it's all dark and got the red. And sometimes you can even get it with the sand color, the, the tan sand color. There'll be, like, a side that's all sandy. And then a side that's been battered by the wind and everything. It's really neat. The Canyon Diablos are really cool. So, yeah, no, I mean, the solar system formed as it was, and the planets were fairly uniform. The inner planets are rocky, the outer planets are gassy. You know, um, almost all the planets have iron cores to them, except for Mars. Um, why that happened that way, I don't know, but they kind of, Mars and Earth have very similar timelines. Right, as far as their formation. So, what do you think of Uralu, that rock that's in Australia? My niece is in Adelaide, Australia, living. But what do you think of Uralu? If we, what is that that projects out of the Earth? You know, so I'm not familiar with it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not familiar with that. Or I think it's called Irish rock. A Y E R S. Yeah. Okay. Or E R S. Yeah. yeah. Irish rock. Cool. Any other questions, comments? I can do a little bit of show and tell, but I think they want me to go out and operate the 20-inch telescope. Okay, just as a matter of interest, um, we, we, I'd say every week I get a call about, from somebody up here about something they see in the sky, and just this week somebody was uh, out in, um, I guess, in Uigo and saw early morning this really very bright uh, – yeah, 
meteor may have actually been a boloid because in that it actually broke apart in, into multiple um, space junk. Yeah, or it could be space junk. Yeah, exactly. But uh, anybody happen to see that this past a couple of days ago? All right. So that I means there's stuff coming in, you know, every night. Yes. So it's a flash, right? Yeah, yeah, a flash and a tail. Like a yeah. Well, it was it was it was early morning in this case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, and we we could see something tonight too, so it's it's worth going out. Um, so you're certainly welcome to uh, to stay and um, and talk with Patrick. But uh, uh, again, I think we'd like to try and, and get get you out in the scopes. We've got uh, Jupiter and Saturn, um, both in well in in the scopes on the yard, and uh, and then we'll uh, in in our in our permanent domes. We'll uh, we'll uh, both the sixth uh, when you go in the the Observatory. The one on the left is called a six-inch scope, scope, and then the one on the fourteen, uh, one of the right's a fourteen. Those are both uh, optical scopes, and uh, so invite you to go out and uh, again, you cannot leave here until you look through the scope. All right. Can you see Venus? Venus is uh, basically set at this point. Okay. I was wondering. Yeah. Oh, who's got a question? Oh, Mark. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Mark, you What, well, you're seeing you with a like a, a like a sideband. You, you'd hear some signal. It's it's um, the fact AM or FM is more the modulation type, so it. Um, if somebody was was talking, you'd be using a particular modulation tail, like frequency modulation. You, you know, so if you hear anything, if there's any kind of a radio signal, you could hear it with FM, you could hear it with AM, you could hear it with sideband. But, um, I, yeah, yeah. But also, there are people that actually will use the ionization trail to bounce their signal off of it. They call that meteor scatter. And they can basically bounce their signal off the ionization trail and, and communicate, uh, you know, up to fifteen hundred miles off the. Yeah. That's great. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. Sure.